verse 9 through 10. And I'm going to read it from the board because my translation may be a tad bit different. So if you don't mind, I'm going to read it from up here. The Lord is a refuge for the oppressed, a stronghold in times of trouble. You all said, Amen. Amen. Those who know your name trust in you. For you, Lord, have never forsaken those who seek you. Amen. Let us pray. Gracious Father, Lord, I need you so much, dear God, to anoint me with your holy oil. Dear God, uh, to be able just to preach, dear God, to these fine folks is a privilege. But Lord, it's a great responsibility. And I need you, Lord, so much to help me. I pray, Father God, you'd bind the enemy of our soul from us today. Lord, you put a guard on my mouth, and I only say those things that will please you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen, amen. The title of the message this morning, Knowing God. And I don't know about you folks, but there have been times that I've been in the car or on the front porch, and I've seen a picture like this, maybe a sunset or something where God has just painted a beautiful, beautiful picture. And I sit there and I'm in awe of what a God we serve. It's just, my mind is so little. But I want us this morning to talk about knowing God. Our text is another portion of a psalm written by David. It was said that David was a man after God's own heart. And I want to share with you this morning that David could write the words of our text because he knew something about God. How else could he write, the Lord is a refuge for the oppressed, a stronghold in times of trouble, unless David had indeed experienced God protect, God's protection in times of trouble. How else could he write, for you, Lord, have never forsaken me, forsaken those who seek you, <clears throat> unless he had experienced God's care and faithfulness and knowing that God would not leave him. We will never know God, we as all of us, human beings. We will never know God until we've experienced him. We can read the Bible. We can read about God. We can read all the books they got out there about God or whatever. But we will never begin to know God until we've asked him into our life and surrendered our hearts to him and begin to serve him. Then we will begin to start knowing him. We will never know his love until we face, until we, with faith we see him dying on the cross. We will never know God's forgiveness until we confess our sins and experience his pardon. We will never know that he is faithful to provide until we've been in great need and experienced his provisions that he gives us. The Apostle Paul, when writing to the church at Philippi, said, I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of sharing in his sufferings. And then also to the church in Ephesus, he wrote, I pray that you being rooted and established in love may have power together with all the saints, here it is, to grasp or to know how wide and how long and how high and how deep is the love of Christ. Friends, experiencing God is to know him, and to know him is to experience him. Brothers and sisters, before we go on with the message, let me share this with you. Knowing God or to know God is an ongoing process. <laughs> in an ongoing desire. In our small, and if you excuse it, our pea brains, our knowledge is but on the smallest scale when it comes to knowing God. However, as I said earlier and shared with you, the Apostle Paul, with the desire, I want to know God. 
I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection. I want to share with you this morning, no matter where you are on your Christian journey, I want you to leave this morning knowing God better than when you walked in the door of the day. And if you are here this morning and you do not have a relationship with him, folks, you're in the right place. I pray that the day before you leave, you'll begin your experience and your relationship with God by asking him into your heart and making him king of your life. I want to share with you this morning a couple of things about knowing God. First of all, Abraham knew the God who provided. We all know the story, if you've read your Bibles very much, you know the story that Abraham and Sarah were promised a son in their old age. And indeed, when Abraham was 100 years old and Sarah was 90, think of it, ladies, when Sarah was 90, she gave birth to Isaac. Through Isaac, God promised Abraham that his descendants would be the number of the stars in the heavens and the grains of the the sand on the seashore. Sometime later, after Isaac was born and grew up some, we don't know the exact age, I can't find it, the exact age, but God came to Abraham in Genesis 22 and he tested Abraham Here's this promised son that would bring the inheritance of Israel. And God says to Abraham, Abraham, I want you to go up on a certain mountain and I want you to go there and offer up your son as a sacrifice to me. In those days there was child sacrifice, but not by God's people. Again, this is a test, but Abraham didn't know it. Abraham took his son and some wood and some fire to the mountain that God had instructed him. The Bible says that when they reached the mountain, Abraham told the servant who had accompanied him there, me and the boy are going on to the mountain. You wait here for our return. Okay? We're already getting a hint that Abraham is counting on God to do a miracle. Because for a sacrifice to be offered, naturally, it has to be killed. Yet he said to the servant, we will return. The Bible says that as they were climbing the mountain, and I can just picture this, I I try to think practically when I read the word, as I said before, I can imagine them climbing up the mountain, Abraham and and Isaac, and They're carrying the fire with them and they're carrying the wood with them. And Isaac looks up at dad and says, dad, and I'm not trying to bring him down. They call him father more in those days. Father, here's the fire and here's the wood. But where's the sacrifice? And then he says it. My son, God will provide. God will provide. They go on to the top of the mountain. And Abraham sets up the altar. And he lays the wood on the altar. And he goes and gets his son Isaac. And picks him up. Again, I don't know how old he was. And lays him on this altar. Think about it, parents. And lays him on this altar. Again, Abraham's mind is, we will return. God will provide. And as they laid him on the altar, and Abraham raises the knife to kill his son, he's not going to burn him with him alive. He's going to kill his son and then burn him on a sacrifice. And as he raises the knife to kill Isaac, the Bible says, an angel of God called out from heaven, Abraham, Abraham, do not lay a hand on the boy. Now I know that you fear God because you have not withheld from me your only son. Now here it comes. 
The Bible says that Abraham looked at that moment and there caught in the thicket was a ram. So he took Isaac off the altar and offered the ram as a sacrifice. And here it is, folks. Abraham called that place God will provide. A side note here that I read somewhere, I hope this was a, fact, a true fact, that on the other side of this mountain was Calvary. Where again, God provided the sacrifice for you and for me. For us to know God as the one who will provide, we have to trust Him. Folks, I know that you're like me. There have been times in your life when God is urging you to do something or you're going through something very difficult and you feel God's urgence to do something about it and you don't, you're just so afraid. You don't know why. How can I do this? How can I step out in faith like that? And God is saying, like he said to Abraham, trust me, I will provide. Amen. God will provide for every need that you and I have in our lives. Whether it's materially, emotionally, or spiritually, God will provide. Amen? I want you to know this morning, before you leave this church, to be reminded, and you know that God is the provider for you and for me. The little song goes, great is thy faithfulness, great is thy faithfulness. Morning by morning, new mercies I see. All I have needed, your hand has provided. Great is thy faithfulness, Lord, unto me. Folks, this morning, everything that I've ever needed, God has provided. And I'm so blessed today. Because he's provided. But best of all, he's provided his son. Because we're in desperate need, folks. Without Jesus. We have sins that will keep us out of heaven. But God has provided his son. On the cross. That we can have forgiveness of our sins. And inherit heaven one day. Amen? Amen. Secondly, Moses knew God as the Lord is my banner. Let's rush forward, and I'm getting a little bit of backwards here because I'm going to talk about the I am in a few minutes, but this is after that, but what's okay. But let's rush forward to where the Israelites have been rescued from Egypt, and they're on the way to the promised land. And on the way to the promised land, it was not all easy going. They encountered people that did not want them to cross their land or did not want them to get to where they were going, and so they made war on them. A group of people called the Amalekites came out to attack the people of Israel. On the day of the battle, Joshua led the Israelite army against the army of the Amalekites. Moses told Joshua that he was going to the top of the nearby hill with him. He, with him, he took the staff of God that he had held over the Red Sea and parted. He took that staff and he went on top of the mountain. The Bible says as long as Moses held up his hands, the battle was being won by the Israelites. But as soon as it dropped them down, the Amalekites began to win the war. The Bible says when Moses' hands got too tired to hold up, that they came beside him, two men, and held his hands up, that he would be able to hold them up while the battle was going on. The Bible says that he's held up his hands until sunset. The battle was over. The Israelites won the battle. That day, Joshua's army defeated the army of the Amalekites. The Bible says that Moses built an altar and called that place, The Lord is my banner. You see, a banner was like a flag, also called a standard that was on the end of a long, tall pole. And it always went out ahead of the army when they went into battle. Their standard, their banner went out ahead of them. The banner had two purposes. One was to identify who they were. 
This is the Israelite army. And then also the, the banner was up there held high. And I like this idea. The banner was held high in the midst of the battle. And the men that were fighting, and there was just all hand-to-hand -hand stuff, could look up and see the banner. They would be encouraged by seeing the banner. It's kind of like when we see the flag and we get encouraged. This is our country who we love, right? And they would see this banner and they would help them to be able to fight. And also they would know where they're at in, in the battle. The banner that Israel raised said, we are the army of God. When you and I fight our battles with Satan, here it is. I want us to know the Lord is my banner. Amen. We're in a battle, folks. I'm not telling you anything new. I don't have to have any special brains to remind you that we're in a great war. A war not even as much physically as it is spiritually. The enemy is out to destroy us. Right? But may we hold up high the banner of the Lord is my banner. For we are God's people. He is our captain. He will help us to win the battle. I'm afraid to say that in this generation in which we now live, the banner of God, the standard of God has been lowered. It is hard to see in the midst of all that the world has going on. It's hard to see the banner of God. However, it's really not the world's fault. The world is just going on by the way of the enemy and one day will be destroyed. But the Christian should be the banner carrier. You and I today in this church are the banner carriers. We're out there in the midst of the world. Do they know who we are? Do they know who we serve? Do they know who our captain is? Unless we hold up the banner. Amen? Amen? Amen. We're the banner carriers, if you will. It is the Christian's responsibility to hold up the banner of God. Now, I don't mean it's literally a stick with a flag on the end. But in our witness, in our, in our attitudes, in our behavior, when we're out there in the world, do they see Jesus living in you and me? This is our banner. Yeah. Amen. Some banners are bigger than others. <laughs> but this is our banner. How we act. Who we call our God. When we're in service for Him. We are the banner of God. Isaiah 11.10 says, In that day, the root of Jesse, who's the root of Jesse? Jesus. Will stand as a banner for the people. The nations will rally to Him and His place of rest will be glorious. Our banner is over us is God. Amen. Amen. Lastly, this morning, and going back to Moses again, and this is really preluding to what we just talked about, the, the battle and all. But let's go back to when Moses was called up on the mountain and Moses saw the burning bush. And God called from the bush, Moses, take off your shoes, you're on holy ground. And God gives to Moses the Ten Commandments, of course, but he gave a call that comes later. The Ten Commandments come later. At this particular time was a call. Moses, I've heard the cry of my people in Egypt. God's going to provide. And so we know the story that God told Moses, I want you to go to the Pharaoh. I want you to deliver my people from Egypt. And Moses gives his excuses of why he can't go and this kind of thing and all of that and so forth. And finally Moses comes to him and says, by the way, God, who am I going to tell them is sending me here? 
But what authority will I have to say let my people go? And God says, Moses, you tell them that I am is sending you. That is so awesome. Because if you really think about what it is to say that I am, when God calls himself the I am, he was saying to Moses, I've always been. I am now and I will always be. I am eternal. He was saying, I am everything you will need for the task ahead. Do not be afraid for I am is with you. Friends, on this Sunday morning, I want to remind you that the God that you and I are serving is the I Am. He's the one that created this world. He's the one that's still over this world today. And He will be over this world tomorrow. And in the worlds to come, talking about heaven, He is the great I Am. And He is the one that is with you today. There's nothing new to God. The troubles that you and I are facing, they're not new to God. He has, he has seen those things since the beginning of time. After sin and Adam and Eve sinned, sin has been with the world forever since then. There's nothing new to God. Your sin, there's nothing new about to God. Sometimes people get the idea, my sin is too great. There's nobody that's done as bad as I have. So like the Apostle Paul, don't it? Apostle Paul said, I was the worst of sinners. But folks, your sin is nothing new to God. He's seen it all. And here's the ticket, though. He still loves you. And he still wants to save you from that sin. Amen. The great I am. I want to remind you today. Whatever God has called you to do, I want you to know that wherever He leads you, no matter what the circumstance he, you find yourself in, the eternal God who is and was and is to come will go with you. Amen. Closing, friends, I don't know how you feel, but I want to know Abraham's God as the one who will provide. And if you don't know that this morning, before you leave, I want to remind you, and I want you to pray that you'll know the God who will provide for your tomorrows. I know every one of you, we can all, we can all act up mighty, mighty uh, uppity and say, I ain't worried about tomorrow. I need to see you at an altar before you leave. If you, can, if you want to try to say that. Because all of us are concerned about tomorrow. All of us are concerned about the future of our children and our grandchildren. I want us to know this morning the God who will provide. Amen. I want to know Moses is God as the Lord is my banner. Folks, I want to be able to walk out of this world. And no, no holiness about me as far as myself goes. But I want to walk out in this world and people see me and say something is different yes. about that person. Right. Whether it be in conversation, whether it be in action, whether it even be in attitude. I want my banner to be, I love God. I'm a Christian. I want that banner to be over me. And this morning I'm sure that all of you want the same thing. If you don't know God is your banner this morning, I want you to pray before we leave this place and say, oh God, I want to be your banner. I want to know the great I am. And if you're here this morning and you don't know what it is to be able to trust in God and to lay all your burdens and all your troubles before him. I want you to remember know this morning before you leave the great I am. That he's with you today. He'll be with you tomorrow. Amen. Amen. I want to know Josh, no, I want to know as Joshua knew God as the captain of the Lord's army. 
Folks, we're still on the winning side whether you believe it or not. And we have a great captain that's leading us. I just get that picture in my brain and I see the revelations end and I see coming out of heaven the white horse. The one on the white horse is our victor. And on his thigh is written the Lord of Lord and King of Kings. He's our captain this morning even in our world today. I want to know Daniel's God. The one who closed the mouths of the lions. The Hebrew boy's God who saved them in the fire. I want to know David's God who said the great shepherd of the sheep is mine. I want to know Peter's God as he walked on the water. Paul's God as he said the one who can save the worst of sinners. I want to know John's God who said the one who sits on the throne in heaven. Listen, church, many have reduced God to some kind of Santa Claus who gives us what we want or some complaint department head who can complain about our life that's just here to hear our gripes. That's not the God I want you to know this morning. The one I want you to know can still make the blind see. The lame to walk. And the lost to be found. That's the God I want us to know today. Amen. Shall we stand together, please? Gracious Father, I love you so much. You're so wonderful. You're so great. Oh God, I can feel your spirit here. It's not just me, Lord. I feel your spirit here. Lord, I pray for this congregation. I want you to bow your heads, folks, in prayer with me. Gracious Father, I want you to speak to our hearts right now, Lord. God, I know these people are no different than me. They're heavy in the battle of life. There's things on their hearts they're concerned about. Lord, there may be some here this morning that not even met you as Savior yet. You're just God as far as they know. They don't know that they can have a relationship with you. And Lord, so right now I want you to speak to hearts. And God, if there's any here this morning, first of all, dear Lord, that has not accepted you as Savior, they've not been saved, they've not asked you, Lord, to come into their heart to forgive you of the, you forgive them of their sins. Right now, while we're praying, Lord, I ask you, speak to their heart. And then, Father God, the rest of us, Lord, that have met you, Lord, and we're in a relationship with you, Lord, but oh, God, to know you better. To know you better. To know you as our provider. To know you as their banner over us as love. To know you, dear God, as the one who always provides for us. The great I am. Oh, God, that's what we want this morning. We want to know you those ways. I'm just going to give an invitation here. And, I, and I, folks, please don't let anybody think keep you. If you would like to come forward this morning, if it's a matter of coming forward to ask Jesus into your heart, come forward. I'm not going to beat you on the back and talk to you a long time. I'm just going to pray with you. But if you're here this morning and you want to come and ask Jesus into your heart, come on. You're among friends. People love you here. If you're here this morning and one of, the, one of the things about God that we reminded you about this morning, you want to be reminded about you knowing God is your provider. God is your banner. You want to be able to walk out in this world. People know that you're a Christian. You want to know the great I am who will always be with you. Won't you come forward and just pray? I'm not going to give a long invitation, but if you feel the God's heart, God speaking to your heart in any kind of way, won't you come forward and just pray? Anybody? Come on, folks. We're among brothers and sisters who love us. We're not here to condemn anybody. All of us have to come to the way of the altar. 
Another way of asking Jesus into our heart. Anybody else you want to come this morning? Do you know God this morning? Is it fresh in your mind who God is? Again, if you need to come this morning, come and pray. Anyone else you want to come and pray this morning? Bless this one. Anybody else that want to come and pray before we go to prayer? Amen. 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 Father God, we ask you, Lord, now to go with us to leave this place. Oh, Lord, how much we love you. How awesome you are. Thank you, Lord, for every person. Dear God, has been here today. Bless us in Jesus' name. Amen. And amen.